So, and without stealing further time from Keith McManaman, who's coming here from uh, Toronto, who's working at uh, Siphon, a censorship circumvention NGO, and uh, she's speaking about evading the censors in 2018 now. So, uh, censorship uh, year roundup. I'm very happy to have you here and to yeah, see your talk now on the last day of Congress. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming this afternoon. Hope you had a fantastic Congress this year. I know I did. Uh, thanks for sticking around to the final sessions. Um, for many of you, this will be the last talk you see until next year, so I hope it's worthwhile. <laughs> um, and to everyone watching uh, the stream online, um, hello and welcome. My name's Keith McManaman. I'm an analyst at Siphon, where we operate a circumvention network that's used worldwide by tens of millions of people. And we provide free open source circumvention tools for Windows, Android, and iOS. Yes, there is a circumvention tool that's running a whole device VPN for iOS. It's iPhone. Due to its accessibility, uh, freeness, localization, and overall network resilience, uh, that, has, that has made Siphon a widely adopted circumvented tool, <coughs> uh, which provides a decent sample size of internet users and therefore a reasonable barometer of circumvention tool usage in a country, which makes it an apt vantage point from which to analyze the impacts of internet censorship. In my work, the kinds of questions that I'm interested in, in are how the social and political dynamics of information controls in different places, for example, the trends in the censorship legislative environment, political cycles, social unrest and social movements, emerging discourses in the media and online, how do these factors add up and determine what content is accessible, and how does that shape people's online behavior and their use of circumvention tools, including Siphon? <coughs> Oops. This is an overview of what we'll be talking about today. I'm going to go over the basic, um, basics of censorship technology and how it's deployed. I'll talk about some of the uh, circumvention methods and technologies that are in use today. I'll recap some notable events from the past year, and, and then <clears throat> talk about some notable trends that we've observed um, in this environment. Just a short note on uh, framing and metaphors. Um, the cat and mouse game is a terminology that's kind of widely uh, used to describe the interplay between the, cir <clears throat> excuse me, the circumvention tool providers and the sensors. Um, sometimes you'll hear like militaristic kind of framing, like the uh, battle for, for the free internet, or uh, the technological, <clears throat> excuse me, the technological arms race. Um, I just want to say that there's nothing really, uh, there's no Sylvester and Tweety, uh, there's, no, there's nothing mad gap or wacky about it, as you will see. So what is internet censorship? It's the control or suppression of what can be accessed, published, or viewed on the internet. I just took this definition from uh, the Wikipedia. And it comes in many different manifestations and, for and forms. I'm going to be focused on the digital interceptive forms of, uh, <clears throat> of censorship, which is what circum circumvention tools are uh, designed to deal with. But as you can see, there are other uh, very important <clears throat> there are other very important uh, 
categories that uh, have increased in their pre prevalence in, re in recent years. Specifically, the shift from uh, direct inter interceptive forms of censorship, sometimes referred to as the first generation of information controls, to the second and third generation, which is characterized in this excellent series of, uh, called the Access Series by Ron Debert and the Citizen Lab and his colleagues, which, really is, <clears throat> which is really the seminal work on, on that transition. Um, so this is what we'll focus on for this talk. Censorship is preventing you from treading all of these fascinating, wonderful uh, paths. And it does, that by <clears throat> it does that by taking advantage of certain features in the way the internet works. How they're able to do that is the sensors control uh, all connections across the international gateway to the respective country. Through the information ministries, they control the internet service providers, and they possess powerful methods of detection. Increasingly, the inter internet censorship space is enabled by private sector actors. Uh, the cost of purchasing and running um, those technologies that allow you to maintain national blacklists, um, sort and filter different types of traffic, uh, have become much more accessible for national go governments and to deploy at scale. The methods that we're going to go over uh, vary in their complexity and their resource intensity. This is something called the OSI model of uh, basically computer and telecommunication systems. Suffice to say that censorship can happen at all layers, from the application layer all the way down to the physical infrastructure. So one of the lower level tactics is IP address, <coughs> IP address blocking. Sensors can learn the IP addresses of the sites that they want to block and add those to a, a blacklist of forbidden IPs. So requests to those addresses will be discarded. It's a simple diagram of how that looks. So when you attempt to visit a site that's blacklisted, you'll either get a connection, re <coughs> a connection reset or a 404 error. The weakness of IP address-based blocking is that a lot of IPs are not static. In many cases, they're hosted on content delivery networks, which uh, are ephemeral in a way. They shift from place to place, and people's IP address could constantly be migrating to a new uh, location. So it's not effective, and it's a lot of work to maintain oftentimes. Uh, it also comes with a high risk of collateral damage. Like, you'll tend to block other parts of content that uh, are hosted on the same IP. <laughs> and uh, generally, this, this kind of works better for blocking either uh, sp specific apps, basically, rather than specific uh, content. In the same vein, uh, URL blocking involves a blacklist of uh, forbidden URLs. And when you attempt to visit that, uh, or a keyword, then, um, or a blacklisted keyword, then your, requ your request will similarly be rejected. <coughs> Port blocking also works the same way. So the sensor can choose a certain port that they don't want to allow any traffic through, and uh, similarly, you would not be able to connect to those endpoints. <coughs> OK, uh, DNS hijacking, or sometimes called DNS poisoning, DNS spoofing. Um, this involves basically the uh, DNS lookup process, so how, uh, how a URL is resol resolved into an IP address. Um, because that's controlled from uh, um, a highly centralized vantage point, the sensor can actually intercept your DNS resolution request and, and deliver uh, a, a page of their choosing, basically, instead of the page that you've requested. 
Typically, that involves a, uh, a block page of some kind saying that uh, you know, the site you've requested to visit is uh, forbidden. Uh, but they can also even deliver a malicious page pretending to be the page that you've requested but actually isn't. There was a case in China before uh, Wikipedia was uh, HTTPS enabled, or SSL enabled. Um, if you requested the page for Tiananmen Square, the art Wikipedia article, they were actually delivering a kind of sanitized version of that, of that site instead of the uh, legitimate article. Uh, of course, H HTTPS adoption kind of prevents blocking specific subpages or, um, nowadays. So if you're in Iran, for example, this is a page that you might see uh, that says, you can't go to this site, but here are some uh, great other sites that you can visit. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, this is a block page if you would see, uh, that you would see that's put there by the information ministry. So in both cases, there's a clear kind of accountability, someone, someone that you can contact, an email address, someone that you can contact about your uh, inability to access that content. But oftentimes, your request will just fail to complete. You might get a 404 error. And uh, there's not a clear indication of, is this site uh, banned content? Is there a problem with, my, uh, with the content provider? Or uh, is there a problem with my own internet connection? So some kind of ambiguity as to why you're not able to visit that content. <coughs> Keyword filtering is kind of an escalation because it allows the center to filter uh, URLs based on keywords anywhere in the path name. Again, pre-HTTPS, that was a bit more relevant because uh, TLS or SSL enabled connections, you can't see into, into, the path, into the path name except for the top level domain. And uh, it also allowed them to block new or unknown pages that are related to that type of content uh, rather than having to discover the domain and the IP address and add it to the blacklist manually. Um, they also have the ability to blacklist or whitelist entire protocols, say uh, HTTPS. If they can't see into it, uh, this is something that happened in Iran in the 2013 elections. It's so a gradual escalation between the circ circumvention providers and the uh, sensors there, which culminated in eventually only HTTP traffic being whitelisted. Uh, and obviously, I'll, I come back to the term collateral damage. That really is something that can uh, break a lot of other essential internet services and uh, make that essentially unusable. Deep packet inspection. This is a word that uh, some may have heard uh, spoken about th through the Congress earlier in the week. Um, this is basically a high-level processing method that allows the sensors to look throughout the content of a web request in the header, in the inner traffic, uh, as well as the URL for certain uh, keywords and other specifications that pertain to a repository of blacklist arguments and choose to block that traffic. So with the keyword filtering and deep packet inspection, the sensors need to process a lot more data. It's very, more, very much uh, more resource intensive. Um, and it really depends how deep they want to dig. Uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning, the technology has gotten much more widely available cheaper and easier to implement, uh, and more effective. Traffic fingerprinting is something that's enabled by that, because even without knowing the domain or the IP address or being able to see it through encryption, the sensor can record what a browsing session looks like and create rules for how the user sees that page, or if they do. Uh, because encryption doesn't, doesn't change that technical configuration. And so they can block a page based on its size, load time, and other kind of technical details, um, which would even allow them to block, say, specific subpages of Wikipedia that are HTTPS enabled, 
they might incidentally block some other page that follows that uh, specification, but that's kind of uh, the trade-off that's being made. Uh, and I will come back to this, but just to mention, uh, VPN traffic, SSH traffic, uh, though they are encrypted, they have a very obvious si signature, a, a size and shape that's identifiable on a network perspective uh, that can be fairly easily fingerprinted, which is definitely a vulnerability. Now I'm going to switch tracks and talk about some uh, circumvention methods. So uh, to each of the censorship methods that I discussed, there's kind of a circumvention answer, and it escalates from there. So if your DNS is being poisoned, then you could switch to an open DNS resolver or a third-party DNS resolver. You've often heard of people switching their DNS to 8888, which is the Google, which is the Google DNS, or uh, 1111, the Cloudflare DNS. It's like Google and Cloudflare maybe aren't going to censor us, you could argue, or it's at least better than trusting your ISP if you're in China or, or Iran or something like that. If you're a content provider and uh, you think that your domain is blacklisted or your, uh, the IP of your domain is blacklisted, you can migrate or mirror your uh, do block, block domain to a new one. I mean, you're always racing the sensors in that case. Like, chances are they can discover your new site just as fast as your readers can. But that's another way of kind of evading the lower level censorship techniques. Um, another circumvention method you can use is by uh, connecting to a web proxy. So, first you connect to some other website that's uh, not on the blacklist. And from there, you use that as your vantage point to kind of browse the open internet. Of course, you can use a VPN. And uh, you can use other circumvention tools like uh, Siphon or Tor, which I'll tell you more about. So <clears throat> SSH, this is a, uh, a protocol that's used to communicate with servers and administrate them. Uh, it's, it's great because it's encrypted. Anyone, any man in the middle that's trying to look at this request, they're only going to see something that they can't interpret. Uh, but again, uh, because of its uh, regular size and shape on a network perspective, SSH can be fingerprinted using uh, the off-the-shelf technology. Same thing with VPN. And so for most censorship regimes, it's easy enough to block uh, VP all VPN traffic in and out of the country just by flicking the switch that says, we're not going to allow VPN. And it, increasingly this year, we've seen during, say, uh, politi the politically important moments like elections or public demonstrations that uh, the censors will uh, utilize this ability and, and leverage that over the networks they control. So uh, which brings me to OSSH. OSSH is an obfuscated protocol. It stands for obfuscated SSH. Um, there's basically ways that you can innovate on the existing SSH tunnel um, to make it as much as possible indistinguishable from random bytes of generic web traffic. So rather than looking like this strange, strange encrypted thing that the sensors can pick out and block, uh, it's designed to blend in with all the rest of the web traffic that's, that's going on. And there are a lot of different things that you can do to sort of change the exact configuration that it follows so that uh, it's as random as possible. And some of the things that you can do are uh, inserting random packets uh, alongside the tunnel, like random web traffic both ways. Uh, you can vary the, the packet size, the packet interval, um, and other kind of uh, ways of making that as amorphous as possible. Um, again, back to the concept of collateral damage, a sensor that's going to endeavor to block something that's indistinguishable from random web traffic uh, based on certain features that they identify will probably cause them to block, incidentally block, some generic web traffic as well, which is a calculus that they're always going to have to make. What deep, packet, what deep packet inspection is doing is it's scanning deep into every web request. Um, but that process, as I mentioned, is quite resource in intensive. So generally, the, the sensor can only look at the first subset of packets, try to make a decision based on 
what, ca what their categorization of that traffic might be and decide to either let it pass or filter it. So um, what circumvention technology is trying to do is make that more computationally intense for them. And it really depends how deep uh, they want to dig. And they do risk kind of slowing, slowing down general internet performance in the country if they do that. Uh, this is another technique called uh, meek, or domain fronting. Basically involves routing traffic through what's referred to as high value domains. So typically large infrastructure pieces of the internet and hiding the uh, real request inside the encrypted, uh, uh, the TLS encrypted connection. Um, for example, forcing traffic through uh, CDN data centers that typically get a different blocking treatment because they are large infrastructure components of the internet that a lot of essential services require uh, to uh, run on. Um, this is a diagram just showing how that request is passed along. And uh, if you're interested in learning more, I'd encourage you to f refer to the paper uh, David Fifield and uh, colleagues worked on, including some uh, Siphon developers. What are some vulnerabilities of circumvention tools? The sensor can attempt to dis disrupt your distribution. If people can't get your apps, then they can't use them. So um, one thing that we do is we have multiple redundant kind of distribution methods. Uh, the sensor can always block your website where you have your uh, applications available for download. They might even uh, blacklist the Play Store or the Apple App Store, or um, some countries that's uh, embargoed and, and not available anyway. Um, so one of, the, one of the innovations that we use at Siphon is email uh, autoresponders. Basically, you can request an, a number of generic email addresses, and uh, the return email you will get has links to secure uh, cloud-hosted download sites, and uh, even the uh, APK or EXE file as an attachment. Uh, the sensors might also be able to enumerate your servers one by one, even if you have thousands and thousands of servers. If they have enough people running enough discrete copies of your software, you have to make sure that they can't catch up with uh, all, your, all your endpoints before you uh, roll them over. So. Um, on the Siphon network, it's fairly ephemeral. Like, uh, no IP addresses are, are really static, and uh, the servers are constantly turning over. Um, really protects us against that uh, that vector of attack. Another thing is, no uh, individual copy of the software is ever going to know more than a very, very, very small subset of the servers, like maybe one percent or less. Uh, Protocol-based attacks are interesting. Siphon is using um, what we call a multi-protocol architecture. It basically protects against uh, the blacklisting of one or even a few protocols because there's always redundant transport methods that uh, the traffic can, can use. And then, as I mentioned, um, we do various traffic obfuscation methods to be resilient to traffic fingerprinting as well. In terms of transports, uh, what makes a protocol relevant? So one, is it effective? Does it work? Does traffic get through? Uh, is it able to actually transport um, enough data, like through actual throughput? Um, secondly, resilience. For how long is it going to work before it gets figured out and, and blocked? Um, another thing is it should have low overhead. You can't in insert too much extra data into the tunnel. Um, and lastly, uh, not placing too much demand on users. For instance, peer-to-peer -peer traffic it requires users to actually do something to run themselves as a proxy node in a network. And uh, that could affect uh, scalability and, and even performance. The reason I say that is because even though some circumvention methods, experimental new methods that have been discovered and worked on are, are uh, excellent, but they're not, they're not as easy to scale from tens or hundreds of people to tens of millions of people. 
especially not, especially not rapidly. And some of the examples I'm going to show will, will show you how this network has really the availability, the ability to rapidly scale itself uh, in critical events, and that keeps people connected to the open internet. <clears throat> Just a small note on uh, network data as well. I'm sure everyone in this crowd has, at one time or another, or regularly uses a VPN. And uh, not all VPN providers are created equal. Not all of them are to be trusted. So um, I want to just make a note on how to be privacy conscious as a VPN provider. You're not technically anonymous from uh, your VPN provider, because at the end of the day, you are agreeing to tunnel all the traffic from your device across some third-party servers that you don't know them, and you don't really know what they're doing with your traffic, and you have to click that button that says, I trust this provider. Um, so with Siphon, we make sure that we don't log, it, log anything. The only data that we're privy to is uh, statistics that come from the network, aggregated network statistics, and uh, no personally identifying information on uh, any users. You can know where people are without collecting their IP addresses, because you can do the uh, GOIP lookup on the client side and uh, discard their IP address without it ever having to leave their device. And another great feature um, that Siphon offers is you just download an application. You don't have to register. You don't have to provide your email address, your phone number, credit card, et cetera. So what this data allows us to do is uh, make some conclusions about the censorship environment that's being faced uh, in different places and try and make sense of how, uh, how our, our network protocols are being affected by those dynamics. Uh, it allows us to see how the software is performing and how that could be improved. and. Uh, it also allows us to ensure that we stay one step ahead of the sensors. This is a map uh, in real time of just showing uh, where uh, Siphon users are in the world. There are at least some users in every country. I've, highlight I've highlighted Sudan in the center there because uh, the recent blocking event uh, that occurred starting December 19th. Uh, it involved basically centrally uh, orchestrated blocking of all the major social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp. And uh, within a matter of days, as you can see, we've gone up to half a million users a day there. Uh, interestingly, a lot of VPN tools are not available in Sudan because of the uh, sanctions, economic sanctions. So. Um, I think that's another, another factor driving uh, adoption. And it works. It's not the first time that uh, we've seen um, a rapid spike in Siphon usage uh, in response to social, social media blocking. There was a case earlier this year in the summer, um, starting about mid-July, in Iraq, where there were protests in Basra and the southern, re southern regions. And again, the government reacted by blocking Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, basically essential social media and communication platforms that people rely on. Like uh, anyone from the MENA region, like you know, WhatsApp is uh, WhatsApp is life. <laughs> A lot of other regions too. Um, and uh, we were above four million users a day uh, over that time period. This is a snapshot of the protest period that began uh, near the end of December last year in Iran, where thanks to, uh, I guess, like good, overall good network performance in the country, uh, where sometimes uh, VPN connections uh, or other circumvention methods like the Tor network aren't as reliable, um, Siphon has a fairly good reputation there. And uh, we reached a peak of 14 million users a day uh, after they blocked uh, Telegram, the, basically the only essential 
uh, instant messaging instant messaging service you could argue that was uh, already like left uncensored by by the authorities there uh, as well as Instagram same case and so ba basically there was a countrywide demand for uh, ways to stay connected with that and that kind of represents almost uh, a fifth or even a quarter of all internet users in Iran uh, were using Siphon during this time period. Another note on scalability is that the network is pushing at the peak like 1.4 petabytes of data per, per day uh, on, a, on networks that are known to be like average, average speed of two Mbps connection or something like that. Um, it's pretty, pretty impressive. And again, I, I, I did mention the sort of uh, the challenges of scaling peer-to-peer -peer type uh, circumvention services. Um, I, it, one of the advantages of having a kind of cloud cloud-based uh, centrally managed system is that we are able to to uh, provision servers rapidly when there are uh, incidents like this. Um, Iran has been some of the most challenging, some of the most sophisticated, some of the most aggressive uh, censorship that we've encountered over the past year. Um, and that comes from their motivation not just to block content, but also to block the methods that people use to get around the filtering there, which has uh, become, in, in the past decade or so, a regular part of going on the internet. Telegram was finally banned via a uh, court order, which also stated that uh, Telegram must be blocked in such a way that no Iranian can access it, not even with circumvention tools. And so there, there was a push from the internet providers there, which are, uh, so some countries you might see a lot of heterogeneity in uh, the, blo the blogging enforcement, as, uh, as say the talk that was about the Telegram blocking in Russia, uh, which was given by Leonid yesterday. Uh, his research showed that there was some, some uh, varied compliance or delayed compliance from uh, some internet providers there. In Iran, uh, the ISP seem to be very centrally controlled. And uh, so uh, the blocking rule was basically implemented countrywide. So these statistics are showing uh, daily users of Siphon and uh, a Telegram client that was deployed, integrated with our uh, library called Telegram DR, which uh, within the first day was uh, like already up to close to a million users. This is uh, a shot of Tor usage during the same time. You notice. Uh, Tor direct connections start to drop off in favor of uh, bridges. Um, but that's uh, maybe 10,000 users a day compared with 10 times, uh, 100 times. This is an example of the advantage of the multi-protocol uh, architecture that Siphon is using for transports. It protect, uh, these are just by pro protocol group showing hourly uh, connections. And you can see when one or two types of protocols get knocked out, uh, the balance of connections is picked up by, uh, by the other transports that we use. So effectively, without blocking all the protocols, uh, the network will remain uh, resilient. This is another example showing uh, China during the uh, 19th Party Congress, which happened uh, last October. Basically, beginning in, uh, in July of that summer, uh, WhatsApp uh, voice and video calls were beginning to be blocked, and only messaging was working. Sort of drove the adoption of uh, Lots of different circumvention tools, but there was simultaneously an order to ban VPNs in, in China as well, uh, which, which was slowly being orchestrated and even uh, complied with by parties like, uh, say, Apple, 
which removed VPN apps from the App Store. Um, finally, in about mid-September, WhatsApp was blocked completely. Uh, and you can see that uh, our usage there started to increase a lot. Then at the beginning of the Party Congress, actually an attempt to filter Siphon based on protocols. And actually the protocols that were targeted were uh, not connecting successfully or were taking a long time to connect. But uh, nonetheless, we were able to sustain um, usage through that time period to make sure that people had open access to information. OK. So just a recap of some of the trends that have been uh, noticed over the past year. Uh, for sure, deep packet inspection is getting uh, cheaper and easier to implement, uh, possibly even um, able to look deeper into web traffic without sacrificing performance. Uh, a spec that I saw, uh, it was an article from Radio Free Europe, Radio Lib Liberty, uh, which was about a meeting of the uh, basically DPI filtering providers in Russia, uh, the, the newest spec was they wanted these systems to be able to run at scale, at scale on a one terabit per second feed of data, which, uh, I mean, that's really shocking, uh, shockingly high numbers. So that, uh, that's possibly the next generation of this technology that we're going to see. Um, as I mentioned, a crackdown not just on content, but on, on circumvention tools and VPNs. Um, VPNs especially becoming a lot more easy to block, not just for the sort of notoriously, uh, notoriously sophisticated censoring nations like China and Iran, but anyone, any government can really afford a DPI box nowadays, and it really has just a switch that you can turn off VPNs if, if you want to. Um, another good point is collateral damage is becoming less reliable. So the example that, that I showed from Iran, uh, we observed that, uh, so uh, just, this is just an anecdote on the same story. Basically, uh, even when you have encrypted communication on the internet, some part of that transaction happens unencrypted. It's called the TLS handshake. So basically, when you're going to communicate encrypted to that server, you are going to say, hey there, server, I'd like to talk encrypted with you. The server is going to say, OK, like I can talk TLS 1.1, 1 1.2, 1.3. And then you agree, and then you talk encrypted. So uh, Iran blocked traffic based on some uh, TLS handshakes that were suspected to be being used. The, the TLS handshakes that Siphon was using at that time were emulating some of the most ubiquitous and common TLS handshakes that are used online, like Google Chrome, Firefox, Chrome Android. It was like most widely used kind of web browsers in, in the country. And when this filtering rule was implemented, users reported uh, problems with uh, using those essential uh, internet services, your web browser, starting to, starting to break because of filtering rules that were deployed to target one specific thing, but not surgically enough. Uh, that said, it seems that uh, sensors in 2018, oops, yikes, sorry about that, sensors in 2018 are willing to sustain large amounts of collateral damage or block unreasonable amounts of benign web traffic going in and out of the country, just in an effort to enforce their uh, blacklist rules. Um, another thing that we've seen, not in 2018, but in previous years, is the willingness to even block entire uh, CDNs. So using kind of critical infrastructure pieces as a way of uh, concealing or obfuscating, obfuscating circumvention traffic may not be the most reliable uh, method going forward. Another thing that, that has been observed is uh, sensors are beginning to block only certain IP ranges at the sub-level of the CDN as well that are suspected to be involved in circumvention traffic and kind of like being able to block just part of a CDN instead of the entire domain. 
So that's something to look out for in the, in the coming year. So uh, by way of conclusion, what can you do? <laughs> uh, one, don't settle for partial internet. Anything less than the entire open internet is uh, not the World Wide Web. Secondly, you can't blow the whistle on censorship if it's safe for you to do so. Uh, thirdly, you should use free open source circumvention software and support it. Uh, fourthly, come work with us. If you're a researcher, if you're a developer, uh, if you're a media provider, um, we can work together and uh, we'd love to col collaborate. And lastly, um, especially app developers, you can use our open source libraries. They're all on our GitHub. Uh, if you want to add some uh, censorship resilience to applications that you're working on, then uh, that's uh, something that's highly encouraged. And uh, we'd love to speak more about that. And we have about 10 minutes for questions, so I will uh, leave it at that. Thank you very much. And I already see people lining up at the microphones. And we also have questions from the signal angels. So we just <coughs> hurry to your questions. Microphone one, please. Uh, hi. I wonder, uh, did you mention, like, uh, uh, I see the biggest threat to cen censorship, uh, from censorship is from uh, big tech giants like Google, Facebook, uh, and their manipulative algorithms. So this is like the biggest threat. And you kind of didn't mention, I think this, this would be like, uh, I think this should be the focus, like how do we bypass this? Uh, yeah. Because these this tech giants become uh, more powerful than any like head of any state. And uh, they're like really, you know, I've, I experienced just uh, days ago, uh, we started petitioning, you know, which was totally uh, shadow banned on uh, Twitter and Facebook. So this is the biggest threat from, uh, from censorship, uh, even bigger than uh, state uh, uh, parties. I mean, what's your, you haven't mentioned anything. What's your, what's your perspective on that? I think I did mention at the very beginning kind of the shift f from first generation, that's interceptive forms of censorship, to the second and third generation of, of information controls, which is like, uh, one, being able to have legal mechanisms that enforce uh, the blocking of content, and even the takedowns of content from, say, major social networks like Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and, and other apps too. Telegram uh, has kind of administrators on, on their channels and groups now that are accountable to sort of local laws. That's something that circumvention technology doesn't expressly deal with at this time. Um, we are more concerned with maintaining access to the sort of the web platform itself when it gets blocked. Uh, but sure, that's definitely a concern. I, th I would say a, an even greater and uh, more difficult concern uh, in this day and age than, than simply being able to access content is being able to preserve content that's up there. Um, so that's not something that I have an easy solution for, but definitely something that, uh, that I'm gravely concerned with. Sure. Uh, democracy can be pre-programmed by the, uh, their algorithms and censorship. So this is uh, kind of the biggest threat from censorship as this here. But thank you. Thanks. So next one from the Signal Angel, please. So you mentioned the OSSH protocol that advocates SSH. Uh, what clients and servers uh, can you recommend that implement that protocol? Uh, as far as I know, it's, it's implemented in Siphon. I'm, I'm not aware of any other clients that, uh, that use it. But uh, I believe it's an open source transport. So. Uh, Probably there are some people out there using it. Uh, and I should add to that, um, it's not always guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be the same thing. Like, um, it, it, doesn't stay, it doesn't stay the, the same for long. And probably other implementations of it have different ways of obfuscating the traffic specifically. Hey, we have more questions on microphone two. Thanks for your talk. I, am, I have two questions. One is, um, as I understand right, the um, end user software is open source. Um, how about the server components? Um, 
can I run my own VPN provider? Um, and um, do you plan to, to open source the, the software on the server side? Uh, second question would be like, I can imagine that uh, running a infrastructure that serves uh, so many users at this scale is pretty uh, um, costly. So what is the, the business model if uh, you don't need to register um, and is it donation based? Where do you um, get the money to pay the bill at the end of the month? Okay, first question, thank you for the question. First question first, uh, Siphon is open source. The client's, client software, server software, uh, or server code, it's all in our GitHub. Theoretically, you could compile your own circumvention client, um, run your own network. If you have like some servers at your disposal that you want to do that, then there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Um, second question, sure, that uh, it's definitely a challenge maintaining um, a user a user base this large on on a free on a free service. So, um, some of the ways that that's supported is um, <coughs> one we we have. Uh, an app that allows you to subscribe for a premium service for like the sort of uh, not explicitly censored countries like the United States or European Union or whatever. Uh, people that uh, feel conscious enough that they want to support internet freedom for others by supporting the network, that that's really encouraged. We also work with international broadcasters that have a mandate to support internet freedom around the world. and. Uh, we can work with them to uh, basically provide circumvention technology that helps them deliver content into closed societies. Uh, and, ex and in exchange, uh, we have a way of supporting the free users. Okay, thank you. I would take the signal angel again because the others can also come in front then later. Have you seen countries with surprising amount of users, uh, <laughs> countries sure. which are not usually considered to have heavily restricted internet access? Pardon me, could you re repeat the question? Have you, uh, in your statistics, do you have countries where the amount of users in that country surprised you because that country is not usually considered to heavily restrict internet access? Yeah, absolutely. Um, plenty of Western countries have pretty significant um, Siphon user bases, maybe tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of users. But even here in Germany, um, or in the UK, it's not to say that like countries that are known to be free internet, uh, open internet countries, it's not to say that every network in that country is free and open. Um, plenty of institutions, workplaces, uh, universities uh, maintain a pretty aggressive blacklist of some types of content uh, or some applications. So that's, uh, that's something that I see as a, a key driver of circumvention usage uh, in those countries. Thank you. Microphone four, please. Let's suppose I'm a sensor and uh, who likes to use uh, traffic fingerprinting to sensor. And I wonder how efficient is it uh, if I want to keep the number of uh, false positives low? Uh, are there any studies on the effectiveness of traffic fingerprinting? Uh, I want to filter the bad traffic, but to keep the good traffic safe. Thanks for your question. Uh, traffic fingerprinting is, is known to be fairly imprecise. Uh, there's a, there's a um, I mean, I, I don't have any studies I can reference, but anecdotally within the kind of internet freedom community, what uh, people are saying is that it's, it's becoming better. Um, but yeah, I, collateral damage is a calculation that uh, every sensor needs to make, and in some cases they don't mind, in some cases they don't know what other traffic is being filtered as a result of the measures that they're implementing. And uh, it is, it remains in many ways a con kind of a uh, whack-a-mole approach. There was a there was a study l last year that was on um, specifically like machine learning enabled uh, censorship, um, which was extremely imprecise. It had a lot of false positives. It was like um, something like 80% su successful. They claimed the the researchers claimed, uh, which obviously that's not enough to deploy at, at uh, internet scale. 
Okay, and we have one question at microphone one. Hi, uh, hello, 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 hello. So uh, sometimes I wear your hat and sometimes I put on another hat where I'm your enemy. Um, I won't go into the reasons why. I sometimes uh, find that throttling can be more effective than blocking because you know, a user might get bored downloading, waiting for a YouTube video to load and go away and do something else which leaves the bandwidth available for other people. So I'm wondering if you've ever seen um, that tactic being used where rather than you would actually block a website and give up uh, a message saying, you know, 404 or second action reset or something where you just actually make it unusably slow. You're a sysadmin. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a sysadmin? Of course. <laughs> Um, thanks for your question. Yes, that's definitely a tactic. Uh, I think also trying to diffuse the accountability for censorship is, is another reason that they do that because um, there's sort of no guarantee that it's not a problem with the content provider's site or something. Um, there, there have been lots of examples that I mean I can share with you afterwards of uh, internet throttling used on specific domains uh, to sort of, uh, like in China, for example, famously, kind of not exactly blocking your connection, but just throttling you to uh, a completely unusable degree. I would say when that's deployed on specific domains, circumvention tools still, uh, still work effectively. When it's deployed on a net network scale, then there's not too much uh, that we can do. Or like an internet shutdown, that's one case where it doesn't matter how robust and resilient the circumvention software that you're using is if no one has an internet connection. With one exception, um, notably in, in Siphon history, where somehow we kept networks online in the case of an internet shutdown. Uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Thanks. Thank you. And if we have one more question from the Signal Angel. Have you had governments or other organizations uh, try to fight you legally for enabling their users uh, to circumvent the content filters? No. That is a nice short answer. So we have one more question here, or three more in the audience. Uh, I take microphone two, please. Hello. You mentioned uh, domain fronting as, a, as an effective way for, for high-value uh, domains. Um, when Google and Amazon stop tolerating uh, domain fronting, have you as an organization been in touch with them? We were part of some discussions on the issue since um, we notably do use that as a technique. Siphon has never done domain fronting through Google or Amazon. Um, I mean, to go back to the example of like a circumvention method that works for tens or hundreds of users, but may not work for tens of millions of users, this is, this is a, a, a perfect case in point, I think, for that. It's like, sure, it's a cool trick. Maybe it doesn't require a lot of technical sophistication to put google.com in the header of all the traffic that I send. But if I have tens of millions of users, then that's potentially going to like sabotage the person's domain that I'm using. So any, any domain fronting that's done on a scale that, um, like the Siphon network uses, it's done under uh, close collaboration and, and, and a formal agreement, not, uh, not in the informal way that it, was, that it was being done by so many different app developers, uh, which I think is the reason that it was eventually cracked down upon. And so it does violate the terms of service of, of, uh, of those domains. So, yeah, does that answer your question? So the person on microphone four is now disappeared. Um, not coming back? Okay. So thanks a lot, Keith, for your um, presentation and for answering all those questions. And you're still here for a few off line questions. Uh, that's really nice. So thanks you all that you were here. Thank you. Thanks, Keith.